I have to thank the VNGOC, the WFAD, and everybody who thought that this case would make some relevance here at this discussion. This is such a high-level discussion on policies and uh, things that we need to work for for the future, but I think what I'm bringing here to the table is a practical case on the map of the world that is struggling with the similar problems that we're discussing here, but has managed to engage the communities to take ownership. Having said that, I also want to um, bring to light that uh, what we're discussing here at an international level dealing with drugs and addiction is not an abstract in the country of India. It's Kerala, and Kerala is a tourism state. What I'm representing here is a classic case. The reality on the ground is that we are not ready for a crisis like this. We uh, back home don't have the facilities to deal with the numbers that's being brought to our tables. We work with children between the ages of 12 and young adults 22. And when I say it's alarming that we have epidemic numbers coming out of age groups of 10 and 12 year olds using narcotics, and what we've done, get the community to take ownership of the problem. As much as we do high-level discussions and policy at the country level and work on legalization of a whole lot of um, you know, measures for rehab and, uh, and care and for women, uh, we fail miserably when it comes to actually enforcing the law to take control of our, our communities where this is being pushed. And uh, a classic number is out of 100 children, a typical uh, batch of 100 children that we train, we get 8 to 10 children coming asking for help. 8 to 10 percent is high. And uh, the forecast of the next uh, five years to come, this number is going to multiply. What have we done? We've actually, um, at the cost of sounding a little controversial here, I think uh, we've, uh, and the lack of time for me to explain what we do, um, we, I've used the analogy of actually um, building fences, because that's, what, uh, that's how easily we are able to connect with our communities. We teach them to uh, take ownership of the problem uh, by standing up for the issue, and we talk to all cross-sections of people, uh, all stakeholder groups in the community, um, though we focus only on the children. We work only with the teens and young adults, but the uh, society has to take ownership. And uh, this is important for us because um, the way it's being uh, discussed at young adult levels in the country that I'm coming from is that um, they're exposed to internet. We are very internet savvy. Our network uh, connections are immense. Morning Sri Lanka was discussing about drugs being delivered to your door. They don't even care what, what is in the package to be delivered. So we're talking about an economy that is actually booming because of its startups and because of its um, IT connectivity. But here is this big problem that we're ignoring with uh, having this delivered to the door to youngsters. So. What we've done is got um, this entire district of uh, in Kerala mapped for places that we call high-risk areas. When we say high-risk areas, we're talking about kids between the age of 12 and 22 who will either be exposed to this. For them, it's a way of life because they are muling it. They are actually delivering these drugs to tourists and other bunch of people who uh, have a demand for this. Or it's part of their culture. So at the end of the day, it's, um, it's part of their life. So th these are kids who are at high risk. High risk would um, mean that if you went around the community and asked common folk if they knew anybody who is using drugs, your, um, your feedback is that everyone in the community would either know a family member or a relative or a friend, a close friend who either suffered or who succumbed or is struggling with a problem. And um, this is not just the red flagged areas that we're talking about. This is becoming like a state problem. And the state is failing to address it because we run on the revenue of tourism.
this is one case, very insignificant on the map, but this is the case elsewhere in the world, and this is what we are fighting for. So our community uh, analogy for putting up fences is very simple. We, in fact, teach them, the first process is to measure your problem. Even if you're going to put up a fence, you need to measure the yard. You, know, you need to know what you're putting up your fence with. So we teach them to deal with uh, the denial. Initially, uh, everybody is in denial, starting from the government to the families of the victims or um, the, the people who peddle. They're all in denial with the problem that uh, this is looming large. So we teach them to handle that. The second bit is we give them the tools to actually put up these fences. What are we doing? We're actually teaching common man about the policies that you all are discussing here in these rooms, about the right to treatment, the right to fair trial, the right to you know, access for uh, safe schools. All that you, be, you discuss here in this room is being delivered to common man in a language that they understand and they can use. What, what it is to go to a, a police station with your case and how to ensure that they take it up and not rub it down, you know, all, things like that is what is taught to a community at very grassroots levels. I think the challenge is we, when we set out, we didn't find uh, ready models for us to work with. We really didn't have any reference from across the globe um, to take home as best practice cases to deal contextually uh, for us. So we did look at the UNODC, the, um, the Human uh, Rights Commission, and uh, we, we're very happy with the high-level discussions, but to contextualize uh, for uh, nations like ours, I'm hoping that you'll have some commission somewhere which will deal with contextualizing what you're speaking to nations. So that's the second step. One, we teach them to measure the denial, the deal, the denial of the problem by measuring it. Two, we give them all the tools that's required in terms of all, all the policies that's being set in place at an international level and the national level. Thirdly, we actually bring them the material. Material is basically we put all the stakeholders together in the community. We bring them at meetings together. We are, teach them to broach the problem and discuss this. We, we sort of empower them to go out and take this up at their own levels. So if I'm talking about one stakeholder group, which would be a, a you know, cab driving union or a auto union, because we have autos, the three wheelers in our country. So we're talking about people as ordinary as them, discussing it with a billion who's driving, must be a tourist or must be somebody, a, a child who is being ferried back uh, from school to broach the topic, to talk about it, and talk about it in ways that they know they're empowering the person and not actually, you know, pushing the drug, because that's the reverse that's happening. And uh, fourth, uh, for the fourth in the process is to actually put up the fence. As much as we empower these communities to do it, um, it all fails in the face of the mafia or the people who are actually pushing this thing. It was discussed in the morning. We have five departments in a, in a state like ours which has the mandate to work around it. The Department of Education, the Department of Women and Child, the Department of Social Justice, the Department of Narcotics and Excise, all of them have these mandates because it is a problem, but all of them work in isolation. There's no um, convergence when this uh, issue is discussed. So we've, we've been successful in actually bringing these five, six departments together. We're hoping at the national level it'll happen. And uh, when they come together, they realize they have funds immeasurable. They have um, power that, that can exceed uh, what they did in isolation. And it's actually effectively working now. Impact is visible. The numbers are coming down. Uh, but uh, it's too early to claim because as I was watching the entire discussion from the morning here, it's all of us are struggling with how to take this into the future thought. And um, before I close, I just want to, uh, from the learning that we have back home, I think the problem is uh, we are all doing our bits to enforce, to ensure a safe future. But I think we fail miserably um, in terms of translating this um, for the future generation. We, we somehow in our communications everywhere, this is my observation, and I'd like some questions or answers around these as to what are we talking to youngsters? Because beyond the room here, there is a whole world of communication happening on pro-legalization lobbies. The youngsters who just don't even know the uh, dynamics of how this rolls out into economics for countries and nations, but discuss this as, uh, as, as um, 
the future of their um, living or lifestyle. What are we doing in terms of actually communicating to that bunch of group? I am looking at the room and I find less of the youth here. Youngsters are very less in terms of representation in this room. We need to have people like that in our big conversations while we have this because they're the future and we need to leave that message for them. This is something that I use always. I quote G.K. Chesterton, and we're putting up fences uh, in our communities, trying to broach the problem, trying to plug it where it matters, trying to teach people to keep their schools and environment safe. Um, I think we also need to share to the next generation about why we're putting up these fences. They should know that when they remove the fence, there was a reason that it was being put up. So that's something I'm requesting the audience here and elsewhere who are actually working sincerely to protect the lives of the future children and uh, communities to somehow crack the problem of messaging in terms of telling the future that we did try to leave a safer world. I don't know where we're getting, but we, we're trying our best now. But the way it's going, if we don't get these small communities to work together and uh, voice for the next generation, they won't know we fought. So thank you. I'm open for questions. It's, um, it's a long story of how we've actually implemented this, but I'm hoping in a few years we will have a case for you here. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Ms. Diana Vincent. And uh, I would like to see if there are questions or any comments. China, you have the floor. 